all for coming. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background. Uh, my, uh, my background is actually in chemical engineering, uh, and I moved into bioengineering uh, sort of the, through an extended process. My, my thesis work involved a little bit of polymers, but it was moving you know, closer into things like tissue engineering. Um, and synthetic biology and chemical engineering have always been uh, really had a little bit of overlap and interest. When I came here, um, I was teaching mostly tissue engineering courses, but we had a international genetically engineered machine team, the iGEM team, which is a group of undergraduates that work in synthetic biology. Um, it is an international program. There are well over 100 teams from all over the world. Um, I've been working in that for the past four years. Microphone. Microphone is on. Oh, okay. Can we turn it off at all? Uh, is that better? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start out with a really general question. Why would an engineer be interested in microorganisms? When I took my first class regarding microorganisms, it was very much disease-based, and it was the beginning of a lifelong obsession with washing my hands constantly. <laughs> <laughs> well, an engineer would be interested because, let's say you come to me and you say, well, with your background, I want you to synthesize a chemical. And you're going to see something like this. You're going to see some glassware, you're going to see a lab bench, maybe a Bunsen burner, you're going to be working on stuff like that. Now let's say I want you to construct something that can actually make lots of chemical, or maybe a, a lot of a couple of different chemicals. And in that case, you're going to see something like this, a chemical plant. This is one of Dow's chemical plants. Then you say, well, actually, what I would like you to do is I would like you to design something that can make lots of chemicals, that can make lots of different chemicals, and can also remake itself. And in that case, I need a city, a major city, this is St. Louis. Yet, all of those features are to be found in microorganisms. They make thousands of different proteins. They reassemble those proteins back into themselves, so they make new machines that can make all of these different things. Uh, and they do it very, very well. So the ability of microorganisms not just to produce things, but to reproduce themselves, and to produce things in very particular, very uh, difficult to synthesize ways, um, is very important, right? If you were to ask me, for example, um, well, what I want you to do is I want you to synthesize every chemical that is in that bacteria, that would take me the rest of my life and I would fail. And then if you said, let's say you succeed, I want you to take all of those chemicals and I want you to assemble them into a bacteria, I would definitely fail. So there's a lot of power in these organisms. So a couple of things about microorganisms. Um, they ruled the Earth for three billion years. Arguably, they still are. Uh, there are a thousand species of bacteria living in your gut. There are ten bacteria in your body for every one human cell. And they are capable of living from seven, minus 17 degrees Fahrenheit to 266 Fahrenheit. To give you some perspective, that's ice and that's boiling water. They're capable of withstanding pHs of minus 0.06 to pH 11.5. Again, for perspective, that's stomach acid, that's milk of magnesium. And they're capable of surviving pressures from 0 to 30,000 psi. On one side, you've got the vacuum of space, and right in the middle there, you have the pressure at the very deepest point in the oceans. Now, how do they do this? Well, let's think about uh, an old yarn. If I have a monkey with a typewriter, and I multiply that by an infinity of monkeys with typewriters, and I give them infinite time, they will reproduce the works of William Shakespeare. Right? <laughs> if I take the oceans, which contain a ridiculous number of microorganisms that's been estimated at 4 times 10 to the 29 microbial cells. Times 10 to the 29 is a mind-boggling number. I'm not yet quite sure I believe it. It is so high. And you give them billions of years, you're going to end up, via evolution, with interesting solutions to very difficult problems. So life has a lot of options contained within it. So beating the cell at its own game is taking a couple of facts. The first one is, microbes are very good at what they do. They are survivors. There are many different versions of them capable of surviving 
capable of surviving in many different kinds of environments due to their interesting solutions to difficult problems. Microbes don't always do what we want them to do. They might make something, but they don't make enough of it. Or they don't make enough, or they might make enough of it, but only under very particular conditions. So they're capable of a lot, but they don't always act the way we want them to act. And other forms of life can do things that microbes don't do, but possibly can. They don't do them now, but there's no reason why they can't do them. You put all those three things together, we should be building new microbes. So genetic selection is something that's been going on for a long time. Uh, via natural selection, for about 3.8 billion years, depending on uh, who you ask. Animal domestication uh, has been happening for 10,000 to 40,000 years. That's actually a cave painting of uh, dogs from Hunter. And plant domestication by humans for about 11,000 years. And you can see that picture there um, on your right is the corn that we're used to getting at the farmer's markets. On the left is its ancestor. Extremely different in both size and presumably deliciousness. <laughs> Genetic engineering basically does the same sort of thing, except by direct manipulation of the DNA. Instead of waiting for something interesting to appear and then breeding it specifically to make sure that it hangs around. And this has been happening for decades. Uh, in 73, antibiotic resistance was conferred to E. coli by taking fragments of DNA from uh, E. coli that was already resistant. And extremely exciting work, followed by the addition of genes from an organism, uh, SV40, uh, were introduced into a mouse embryo. And in 1978, we were producing human insulin in E. coli. There are now six tons of insulin produced every year. So we have evidence that this scales. We can produce lots of stuff. It's not necessarily we can only produce things at the lab bench. There are definite industrial applications, the ability to make lots of stuff that we need. OK, so we're building new microbes. We have to talk a little bit about how we actually build new microbes, because the process is very important. Uh, this is the, the um, uh, general version of what's called the central dogma, which is neither central nor dogma, but um, effectively what it says is that I've got DNA, and DNA is sort of this, uh, this standard um, permanent storage of information, these long molecules that can be read. They can be um, reproduced themselves, so if I want to make a new cell, I can make a new copy of the DNA so that that cell has its own DNA. But the DNA can also be transcribed into RNA. And RNA is sort of like a one-off copy. It's sort of like, you know what, here's a little bit of the DNA that's important right now. Let's make a copy of that so that the cell can use that copy. And it's a temporary copy. If, uh, if the DNA is the permanent blueprints that are kept under wraps, uh, the RNA would be cheap photocopies of those that are handed out to various parts of the cell so that they can get stuff done. The RNA actually performs many different tasks. We're going to focus on one. Uh, that the RNA can be translated into protein. And proteins are also long strings of amino acids that do practically everything else. A lot of the products that we would want a cell to make are proteins. Many insulin is a protein. Lots of different drugs are proteins. Uh, proteins are also structural. It's what the cell is built out of. So if I want new cellular activity, I generally want a new protein to be made. Not always, but generally. If I want a new protein to be made, uh, I'm going to need the mRNA to be there, and the RNA. And if I want the RNA to be there, I want the DNA to be there. So let's take an example of a specific situation that I might have. I want to build a new bacteria. Well, I want that bacteria to be making new stuff. So I could add new DNA to the bacterial genome, which is the blue swivel. I could also remove DNA from the bacterial genome. Basically, so it's no longer making something, which will also alter its behavior. I can also, thankfully, because this is very handy, Add new DNA in a plasmid, which is a little tiny ring of DNA. It's self-sufficient, and it's capable of producing mRNA, which produces proteins, just like the genomic DNA can. The nice thing about plasmids is they're usually easy to sort of pass around from bacteria to bacteria. OK. So a specific example is, what would I do if I wanted to build bacteria that make red fluorescent protein? 
Red fluorescent protein is based off of a jellyfish protein. Um, basically, you give black light and close. Uh, the original version of this was GFP, it was Nobel Prize, because it's a very powerful technique for very simply indicating whether something is being turned on or not. If you see red, or you see green, or there are many versions of this protein that glow different colors, then you know that something has been turned on. And in that case, I would simply want to add the DNA that's necessary and sufficient for RFP to be made. That is going to get made into an RNA that says, hey guys, make RFP. And then RFP protein will appear. So, if I do that, I get something like this. Those are colonies of bacteria on an agar plate. They can shine with the black light, and you can see them glowing bright red because of the presence of this protein that was not present until I put that DNA in there. Until I gave the cell the instructions to make this, it was never going to make it. It comes from an entirely different organism. Okay. So, DNA. Double helix, long chain molecules. I don't want to get too stuck into this because we uh, very quickly abstract it. We know that it's made out of adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Those are the code for DNA. And basically, uh, what happens is that they are polymerized into those long chains so that you can look at the molecule here, but we'll often just say, well, you know what? It's just a G stuck to an A, stuck to a G, stuck to a C, stuck to a T, stuck to a T. And that the other side of it, because it's double-stranded, that double helix, um, has complementary uh, nucleotides. So if I have a G on this side, I have a C on this side, an A on this side, a T on this side, etc. This is the first level of ab abstraction. Very often when we're thinking of DNA, we're interested in the sequence. And we don't look at it in terms of a molecule. We know it is a molecule. But very often the sequence is the important part, because the sequence is the code. In those letters, doesn't spell out, obviously, in words that we can understand, um, partially because we got the four letters. But the cellular machinery is capable of taking that information and using it. OK. So let's say I want to do that red fluorescent uh, protein. I want to make that in my bacteria. Um, well, this is part of, not all of, but part of the DNA that's necessary to do that. And that is as meaningless to me as it is to you. <laughs> what I want to do is I want to actually look at this. I'm going to color code it. I'm going to say, well, parts of the DNA do different things. The first part is in blue, and that's called the promoter site. And effectively, the promoter site is a signal to the rest of the cell that says, hey, right after me, typically, right after me, is going to be a bunch of information for making something. So you should make it. So the promoter is basically a way to tell the cell, this is where something should begin. In red, oh, I'm sorry, in green, uh, is the terminator. And effectively, this is the site that says, cut it out, we're done. So it's not always the case, but usually in between the promoter and the terminator is going to be the stuff that you actually want to get made. And that's my red fluorescent protein. OK. So this helps. You know, I can see how uh, there's a colored bit, the blue bit does one thing, the green bit does another thing, the red bit does another thing. So let's say I have two bacteria. One bacteria has taken up my plasmid, so it's got that RFP information in it. Well, it's going to start making protein, and it's going to turn red. And actually, these are so good at making the protein that sometimes you don't even need the UV light. Sometimes they actually look kind of pink. And then when you hit them with UV light, they glow very brightly. So there's a lot of this protein in there. But this isn't the be-all, end-all. Okay, so what if I wanted to make another bacteria that was really red? Very, very strong, right? Well, I need to alter something. I need to alter the behavior. I probably need to change the DNA to get this sort of change. I might even want to do something a little fancier. I might want to have bacteria that does nothing unless I add some small molecule, and that small molecule gets sensed by the cell, and only when the small molecule is there do I start making protein. So in other words, this is an on-off switch. I can add a molecule, and then the red appears. Under many circumstances, I want this kind of control. I want the ability to make more or less of something, or to turn on or off making something. Now, how would I do that? Well, different functions are going to require changes in the DNA. So I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board. Right? If I want even a slight difference in function, I need to go back and make new DNA. And this is not fun. 
So I go back into here and I go, well, okay, so there, it turns out that there are different promoters. And some promoters are turned on when a small molecule is present. Some promoters are very strong, we make lots of stuff, and some promoters aren't. So what I would do is I'd go, oh, okay, well, I want to change that blue part with some other string of A, T, Cs, and Gs, and I need to go figure out what that string should be. And then I need to figure out a way to cut that out and replace it with the new string. How do I accomplish this change? Well, it's done, and there are techniques to do this, but it doesn't scale well. It means that every time you want to make a relatively small change, you have to go back to the drawing board and start from scratch. Not completely from scratch, but you have to do a significant amount of work. So I wanted to pause. Is this how I should be thinking about DNA? Now, we've already abstracted. We've said, you know, DNA it is a double helical, very long molecule with, that uh, uh, spins, evidently, according to the GIF. Um, and uh, it, it, we can look at the sort of shape. We can look at the charge. There's a lot about that molecule that we can see, but we've already kind of punted it and said, no, no, no. What we're interested in is the sequence. Maybe we can abstract it a little bit further. What if I want to build something that's really, really complicated? I'll give you an example. This uh, is uh, artemisinin, and artemisinin is a treatment versus malaria. 225 million cases per year, 90% uh, of those are children, uh, 800,000 fatalities per year. This is normally something that you get from plants. Uh, it's naturally made by a plant, um, but if something is made by a plant, then you can have problems with weather, right? If a uh, uh, hurricane hits, you might lose a significant amount of your crop. You also have to get the drug out of the plants, and that involves nice solvents like hexane and acetonitrile and lots of other stuff that you don't actually want to use if you can potentially avoid it. So one option that's being looked, in, uh, looked into here uh, in labs um, and in a company um, is to make this in a microbe. And this is, you're not supposed to read that. You're just supposed to see that there's a lot going on to actually perform the chemical steps inside of yeast in this case, to actually synthesize this molecule. All of those colored arrows generally involve this laundry list of enzymes that are required to do all of this. So I would need to find all of these enzymes, and I would need to put them into streams of DNA, um, and I would, might need to find the right version of the enzyme, because there's probably different versions of this enzyme from different organisms, and I might take one from one and one from another, because some are better and some are worse, or some are better in context and some are worse in context. And I might need to do the promoter shuffle by tuning their expression, and tuning their expression simply means, do I want to make a lot, do I want to make a little, do I want to make something in between? So you can already see that the number of changes are maddening, right? <laughs> this process of design involves a lot of trial and error and can be extremely difficult. Okay. So thinking always in terms of nucleotides, those strings of letters can be very difficult. So the question then becomes, who can teach us a better way? <laughs> and I'm completely serious. Let's take a look um, at the instructions for building a Bjorken. And I, I went to the website, and I looked at the PDF instruction files for IKEA, and I chose Bjorken because I like to say the word Bjorken. <laughs> the uh, Bjorken is a medicine cabinet, so it's also appropriate for bioengineering. And if you've ever put anything together, you've, uh, you're familiar with the little cartoon IKEA guy, and the description of parts. But if I break down these instructions a little bit further, what you're going to see is I have a device something that I want to build, the Bjorken. And I have a list of parts, which are what I want to build it with. But, very important, what is left out of the instructions? This is one of the uh, uh, instructions for a single part in the building of this device. And what's left out of the instructions? Well, they don't say anything about the fact that this is made out of galvanized steel, that it has a diameter of this, that the angle of the screw is 18 degrees, that's the, um, the depth of the impression for the Phillips screwdriver is 2.7 millimeters. None of this information is in there. And why not? Because I don't care. <laughs> right? In fact, that's confusing and difficult. Think about it this way. A part 
has different information depending on who's dealing with the part. If I'm making the part, I need to know how the part was built. I need to know how to construct that specific part. If I'm using the part, I need to know how that part interacts with other parts. That's far more important to me. What is the context of this part in building the larger device? And in engineering, for example, you would, you would never say uh, to an electrical engineer, um, well, how was your resistor built? I went to the McMaster catalog and I ordered it. That's, that's how it was built. Um, so we want to be able to build very complex connections, very complex devices inside of bacteria and yeast. And to do that, we want to abstract properly. And this has a lot of opportunities for us. Thinking of DNA as parts means instead of looking at something like this, I can instead think of something like this. I have a promoter part, a protein part, and a terminator part. And they're modular. So in other words, I can switch them out. I can pull the promoter part out and put a new promoter in. Now this requires that these be constructed in certain ways that make them easier to uh, put together and take apart. But there are certainly options for that in molecular biology. And uh, that's a, a leading area of research, the best way to construct these. But this gives us the option, this modular approach, to have plug and play DNA. If I have my original part here, our original device here, I can have a set of promoters. And these are different DNA sequences, right? But I don't care about the sequence. I know that this one is expressed in response to a small molecule. This one's expressed in response to heat. If I heat up the bacteria, they start making it. This is expressed at a high rate. This is expressed at a low rate. And I have different protein parts as well. I have a protein part for green fluorescent protein. I have a protein part for yellow fluorescent protein. So I can say, have um, if this were in a biosensor, I could have many different bacteria. Red means that one thing is there. Green means that another thing is there. Yellow means that another thing is there. So I can then consider building more complex devices. OK. So synthetic biology, this slide, um, is a courtesy of Chris Anderson here in the bioengineering department, is we have the nucleotide levels, A to T to C and the G, but then we can consider parts, which are relatively small collections of uh, uh, those strings of nucleotides that perform uh, sort of simple, specific tasks. Devices, which are made up of many parts, which are of different size. The KG is a kilobasis, so thousands of A's, T's, C's, and D's. Uh, up to the genome level. And this would be synthetic biology. This would be actually taking a look, and of course, this, this is science, so if you ask 10 synthetic biologists to define synthetic biology, you will get 13.5 answers, but <laughs> one potential way of looking at it is this, is that synthetic biology is, is trying to abstract DNA to allow the construction of more and more complex things, um, which is necessary. Okay, so here, one of the original computers, right? And if you wanted to program this, uh, you would pull little wires out of different boards. Uh, you would uh, remove actionable bugs, the, the bugs that uh, you get fried when they walk across the circuit. Um, and you effectively would have very little abstraction. Uh, if any of you who have done programming realize how far you're away from the assembly language, right? The, the computer talks in a certain way, and even you know, people programming in languages like C, I'm a chemist, so I have to mention Fortran, none of you have ever heard it. Um, oh, maybe some? Huh? Um, all of those languages are actually ways to allow you to do things not at the level of zeros and ones. And integrated circuits, effectively taking a look at really very complicated types of circuits, um, so complicated, in fact, that they have to be miniaturized, allows us to have you know, laptop computers that are billions of times more powerful than what's going on here. Biology is done like this. People in labs, lots of tubes. Um, or my my co-author uh, likes to say that you know, he has a, a PhD in bioengineering, yet in most of his day-to-day -day activities were moving small amounts of liquid from one tube to another. Um, Synthetic biology can take this where? Instead of this sort of ad hoc approach where whenever I want to manipulate DNA, I start 
more or less from scratch to be able to build very complex tools with modular approaches and abstraction. So, computer-aided design. Something that's, there are versions of this in, in biology, but if you look at other engineering disciplines, you'll see things like this. If I want to build an engine, I'm going to use something like SolidWorks or AutoCAD. Right? I'm going to use that to help me build my device. If I want to build the chemical plant, I'm going to use something like Aspen. And Aspen effectively means that I plug in a reactor here and a heat exchanger here, and I plug them together, which means there's a pipe between the two, and it will model the activity. It will actually help me to do things. Um, if I want to build an integrated circuit, I'm probably going to use some version of SPICE, which is a way to analyze and build circuits in the computer. All of these are actually ways to figure out how parts work together with one another. On an integrated circuit, I would put different parts of the circuit, and I would plug them all together, and the software would say, here's what the output of this large circuit would be. It's made up of resistors and capacitors, but this is what it does at the end. My chemical plants, it's made up of heat exchangers, it's made up of reactors, it's made up of mixers, it's made up of coolers, it's made up of distillation towers, but when I model it in the computer, it's going to say, here's what the end result will be if you give it this input. We would like to have something like this to aid us in design of biological devices. Um, a couple of things that are being worked on right now, things like BioSpice. BioSpice is basically a program where you put in all the metabolism, and what you might be able to do is say, well, what if I add an enzyme that does some other reaction? Or what if I add an enzyme uh, more enzyme than the cell naturally has. How is the cell going to, to react? Well, this is going to determine how modified cells will behave. Just like if I have an old circuit, and I want to modify it to make a new circuit, I make the modifications in the computer, and I want the computer to tell me, uh, what, what should I do? Will that work, or will it not work? And better tools will even make suggestions, like, you've, that's an interesting reactor you've made there. It's operating at a temperature where everything will boil and explode. So there's the option to have safety information in there as well. But this is a design optimization tool. If I want to make complicated changes, I want to have tools that are going to help me figure out what those changes should be. Uh, there are also tools like Clothum. This was worked on by one of our iGEM teams. Uh, the Berkeley iGEM team has either had um, a wet team, which works in, uh, on the lab bench, um, and a comp team, which works on computational tools, or a single team that has, uh, contains elements of both. And this is a tool, effectively, for helping you implement the construction, right? So one of our, um, one of our projects uh, a couple of years ago was that we wanted to make a bunch of different kinds of proteins, and we wanted to display them on the surface of E. coli. So the protein was uh, basically <coughs> active in the solution. You didn't have to worry about getting stuff into E. coli so that the enzymes could act on it, you would basically have it on the surface of E. coli, so it's open to the environment. Well, that means that we wanted to take a look at, say, 10 different proteins, but we needed different, they're called autotransporters, but they're effectively just ways to get that stuff to the surface. And we had a list of maybe 13 autotransporters, maybe 14. Well, we wanted to make every combination of those two things. We wanted to have every one of the proteins we were interested in attached to every one of those autotransporters. Uh, that year, that team made about 1,200 parts. <coughs> now, they did that using a computer. They did that using a computer and a liquid handling robot. This is designed to help you implement design. So I want to build things. I want to build lots of things to see which ones work and which ones won't. So this is going to help me implement design and automate the building process because it talks to these liquid handling robots. Uh, we have collaborators at the U that are working on this. And we want to implement an architecture for safety checking. Because remember, the important thing about parts is context. How do they interact with other parts? In the synthetic biology, we take safety very seriously. So we want, when we build tools, to say, you sure you want that part together with this part? There might be an issue. And to help the designers, just like uh, a, a good version of Aspen will say, that reactor will blow up, we want to have a good version of our design tools that will say, Think about this. Double check yourself. Okay. So this is Edison. 
Um, and Edison has a couple of quotes that I'm interested in specifically for this talk. The first one is, what you need to invent is an imagination and a pile of junk. And <laughs> that was true in Edison's time. Uh, and it's still true today. But after a certain point, the pile of junk starts looking like a pile of junk. You're going to want some sort of organization. And the Edison approach also gets you this. Now, if we do need to build thousands of different versions of a uh, genetically engineered bacteria or a genetically engineered microbe or genetically engineered yeast, we want to be sure that we're building them quickly and efficiently because we want to test them quickly and efficiently. And we also want the tools to tell us which of those thousand are not likely to work. Which of those thousand, if there's a thousand different options, 10,000 different options, 100,000 different options, what are the first hundred we should do? And that's what this sort of abstraction and design tools really gives us. So models, which is abstractions of these strings of DNA, and also sort of the mathematical models that underlie how they actually work inside the cell, which is more systems biology, but the two have a lot to tell one another. You add design tools to that, tools that are going to help you to uh, figure out the best way to build and the best things to build to perform a certain task. And the physical tools that you would need to actually make these, and that could be the robots that move things around, the enzymes that are also produced by microbes uh, that do all of the molecular biology that are part of the, the sort of uh, toolbox for synthetic biology. If you combine these three together, you have the ability to design biological solutions with increasing complexity and to do it safely and efficiently. And that's really our goal. So what next? What are some of the things that we're looking at in synthetic biology? Biofuels. I mean, effectively taking biomass and figuring out the best way to break it down into useful molecules um, and to do that as cheaply and efficiently as possible. Um, making drugs effectively finding small molecule drugs or protein drugs that we can make and uh, figuring out ways that we can do that in large fermentation as opposed to alternate methods that might be more harmful to the environment, more expensive. Uh, the goal of Jay Keesling in this project is to reduce the cost of this drug from about 250 per dose to around 20 to 25 cents per dose, which is extremely significant. Um, in, uh, in engineering, you, you rel it, it's relatively rare to hear order of magnitude changes in price. <laughs> or, to go really far out, we consider the medical options. Uh, this is uh, work that is done in Chris Anderson's lab. It is a tumor-killing bacteria. It's a bacteria that will find a tumor, inject it into your bloodstream, find a tumor, invade a tumor, and destroy the tumor. These are just a couple of options. People are doing practically anything that you can imagine being done chemically with synthetic biology, but we're also getting to the point where we're considering, you know, bacteria can do more than this. Bacteria don't just make stuff. They also swim, right? They all, swimming is generating force. Swimming is the ability to move from one place to another. Can we use that? They are able to sense things about their environment. They're able to go in particular directions, turn things on, turn things off, in response to what's going on outside of them. How can we take advantage of that? There's a lot of really interesting research going on in here, but I think that to push that research forward, we just want to be able to design things really well and as quickly as possible. So, last, go bears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and thank you for your time today.